Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to Adventures in History. Today's topic is Dearest Mother, Love Ruthie. Ruth Smallshaw Ray's Letters to Her Mother, 1950, Part 57. 1560 Luxor Road, Cleveland, 18, Ohio. November 15th, 1950. Dearest Mother, Daddy, and Bud, I'd just decided to write to you on paper from my notebook when I discovered this paper. It's a half hour before class, and I'll never get the reading assignment completed anyway. As I said in my last letter, it's been my turn to wonder how you are since I've not heard and do hope you aren't ill. John has had a very bad sore throat and cold, <clears throat> and I've been worried about him, been taking sulfa. We had Norma and Cal over Saturday evening, and then John got up early to take me to 8 o'clock a.m. communion Sunday, so it meant he had no morning to sleep in, so I guess that didn't help his cold either. We went to his boss's for dinner Sunday night and had a lovely roast and Yorkshire pudding and watched TV, television. They have a, they have a boy five and a girl eight. Nice. Last night, the vice president of DeBeckman and his wife came with a wedding gift, a lovely pale green woolen blanket. I felt badly afterwards because I didn't even offer them a cup of tea or coffee. We just took out some more health insurance for me with maternity benefits and hope we can begin to plan a family within the next few years. I feel so badly because I'm getting to dislike teaching so much. It's such a shame when I recall how I used to enjoy it so. Norma is planning to leave in January when her, her husband will be transferred. I don't know exactly why, but I guess it's a combination of things that seems to make it so hard. I guess my heart isn't in it like it used to be. Then so many observers excite the children so. I had three young men from the center again today then eating lunch and having noon duty with the kiddies and only half hour free, plus the fact that the children seem quite spoiled. I feel rather selfish, but think another year of it would drive me batty. Just when I'm getting my degree and salary that's worthwhile, I think I'll read Dewey's Reconstruction of Philosophy and find out what's wrong with my philosophy of life. John's finding his course tough, as many as 30 cases a night, and Saturday classes start as well now. I think he's psychic sometimes. He dreamed the exact score of a football game Sunday, and last Friday said, Did you get a letter from Dale? I did Monday, and it, it had been forwarded from the co-op Friday. He just had a feeling I'd hear. She's enjoying Portland, has five pupils, four-year-olds, and Dan has a job with an architect. I'll send the letter sometime. She enjoyed superior school so much that that makes me feel badly too when I don't. Maybe I'd better continue this when I'm in a more optimistic mood. Thursday night. Hi. We found your swell letters when we got home from school last night and really was so wonderful to hear from you. John said, My, your mother writes a nice letter, doesn't she? Then when he read Dad's and thought it quite a novel idea and said what a kick he got out of Daddy's, especially regarding the oil heater and generating enough heat over the bill to pay for it. Sorry to hear about Mr. Davis. It must have been quite bad near the end. Daddy is correct. We have been working too hard but it's a situation that's hard to control since we do have to work and we are taking these courses. I told Miss Bender today that we felt noon duty at school just made it too much, and she said that Dale had said that too. I don't know if anything can be done about it. My dear sweet husband was worrying about me being so tired and came home tonight smiling that he felt he'd solved the problem. He'd phoned his uncle Ted Zook, who prescribed the vitamin tablets before, and he advised some iron capsules, $4. So John brought 
those home too. He suggested a minimum of eight and a half hours sleep and nourishing food, of course. Norma has lost ten pounds since school started, so we're both finding it tough. Today we got a very nice letter from John's mother too, and we're looking forward to seeing everyone in Marion, Ohio, next Thursday. John's grandma is 80 years old. Carol is in a, in a play Friday night, but John doesn't think we can make, make it, though I'd love to. She was asking about the weather in Saskatchewan. We got the Oberlin Class magazine, and our photograph, one outside the church, was in it, and a little write-up of the wedding. Sort of exciting. We'll write more. I love you. Good night, Ruth and John. 1560 Luxor Road, Cleveland, 18, Ohio. November 29th, 1950, Wednesday morning. Dearest Mother, Daddy, and Bud, Has this ever been something? I wonder how much you've heard about the weather situation in this part of the country and how it's been in Saskatchewan. We've been snowed under since Saturday, although the past two days haven't been too bad. I guess it's the worst since 1913, and quite a big thing. You and Regina would think very little of it, but it's tied up everything, and the newspaper estimates the city lost to top $25 million. A week ago was our last school day, and we left bright and early Thursday morning, Thanksgiving, for Oberlin to pick up John's cousin Fred and a friend, and then on to Marion. Just outside Marion, we passed a car. I looked at John. His face is a little fatter. He now weighs 200 pounds. And his hat brim was turned up, then looked at the car. A similar hat and face. His dad. John had already recognized the car, but it was a coincidence. We had a very nice day. The whole clan gathers and they set up card tables all over the house and everyone serves buffet style from a big table, and then sit at the smaller ones and eat and eat and eat, like last year and I guess many others. They certainly are a wonderful family. I think they're all going together and buying the grandparents a television set for Christmas. Carol was in a school play Friday night, and we finally got John to agree to go down Friday night, although we had to come back here because John had to work Friday. We didn't get home until 1.30 because the snow was really coming down and traffic piling up. We passed six small accidents within one mile, so had to be careful. By morning, we decided we'd better not go to Sandusky, and when John's dad phoned us, told them we'd better not try it. John didn't get home from work till 7 o'clock. The traffic was so bad. Saturday, we awoke to find the snow up to the windows and over the fence in back. We made a snowman and dug out the driveway, but then had little idea of the seriousness of it all. We'd planned to go to Joan and Lenny's for a turkey dinner Saturday, but of course couldn't go, and even still only doctors and those in emergencies can use their cars. Our street didn't get plowed out until Monday at midnight. On many streets, the people got together and shoveled them out. The radio was a constant stream of news items and listing of emergencies <coughs> and warnings. The milkman didn't get through until Tuesday, although a man across the street got us some. We weren't supposed to use the telephones, and school won't open until tomorrow, Thursday, and university not until Monday. I guess most of the towns and cities around are in similar shape. I took some pictures Saturday and will send later, but then after I took them, more snow fell. Alex and Vera were driving from Philadelphia as he was to start work Monday, but wired that they were stranded in Bedford, Pennsylvania Saturday, and that road is still shut. In spite of all the excitement and unfortunate as it was, John and I were very fortunate. It's the most we've seen of each other since our honeymoon, and it's the first this place has had a chance to be like a home. Then, too, for the first time, we've had enough time to catch up on things. 
I finally got all the ironing done and floors washed and waxed, and John finally got caught up on all his cases. So we've really enjoyed it, although yesterday he had to return to work, and after waiting an hour and a half for a bus, all full, he came home and later tried again. He got to work at noon and the plant closed at three o'clock. This morning it only took him one and a quarter hours. Good. I hadn't been too cold though and most of the deaths have been from heart failure from overexertion. Traffic in and out of Cleveland had all been stopped too, so that many people away from town for the Thanksgiving holiday are still away. Then, to finally start emerging from this and to see what's happening in Korea. It's just heartbreaking to think that this will be a war in every sense of the word. It was very interesting. Fred, John's cousin at Oberlin, brought along his roommate, a German student, on exchange from Oberlin. Blonde, blue eyes, Chris Wagner, very intelligent, admitted that he was one of the Nazi youths in that regime but said it already seemed so long ago. He was rather critical of America's foreign policy, which everyone seems to be, ridiculed the disarmament plan, which now we are attempting to reverse to rearmament. Thinking of all that and reading some of Arnold Toynbee's History of Societies and their rise, route, and rally put me in a very pessimistic and foreboding mood Saturday. Of course, I became just as elated Sunday and Monday, and we really enjoyed getting things done here. However, the seriousness of this old world situation is still here. Cleveland's motto, the best location in the nation, wouldn't be so appropriate if this war situation goes on. I finally heard from Marion, so was glad to hear they like Edmonton, although she too finds her class difficult. I've talked to so many teachers lately who found children more difficult that I don't know if it were always thus, and whether I'm getting old or whether, as some teachers think, it's a general uncertainty in parents reflected in the children, or whether it's a preponderance of spoiled kids. About Isabel, her calm announcement of engagement struck me in three lights. She used to have as a little girl a terrific imagination and loved to tell stories, it could be. Or then, why did she choose Prince Rupert? Could it have been that she knew a fellow there before she went, and going there clinched the engagement? I think either of either would be pre- preferable than the fact that she's met someone and decided so quickly. However, I'm just an old slow poke, and very glad that I was. I sometimes wonder how I could possibly be so lucky. At any rate, her courtship couldn't be too overwhelming because she mentioned that she only went out Saturday evenings. Well, we'll see. We got another wedding gift, a wooden salad fork and spoon. I've not decided whether to keep the pale green blanket from the vice president of the Beckman or exchange it for a blonde silver chest. We'll see. About Christmas... John has given me the money planned to spend for your gifts, and I've no idea what to get, but must do so soon, so you'll get them in time. Ditto any suggestions? There are so many things we'd like, but mostly things you can get cheaper here. However, it's much more interesting to open a parcel. I'll mention things we plan to get sometime soon. An egg beater, a flour sifter that sifts into a cup, two square rust cushions for the gold sofa, kitchen curtains, maybe a yellow design, not blue, canister set, yellow trim only, cottage style, (coughs) dark green woven doilies and dresser scarf for the bedroom, and a dark green bedspread. I don't think chenille because of lint, but maybe. I think a large goldish colored washable bedroom rug. Maybe reverse these and have dark green rug and goldish bedspread, pastel colored sheets, maybe pale green. John needs gloves and pants, which we hope to buy Saturday, and I a sweater. And John has the most horrible hat he wears, 
so I might try to get him talked into a new one. So you see all the odd things we want are almost impossible for you to find there. You've never mentioned your sectional, and I feel so very guilty for talking you into it when you wanted the bed sofa. I'm so sorry, although that doesn't help, and see so clearly how I acted just like a spoiled child that I am sometimes before the wedding. We look for letters and hope you plan to visit us next June. John's dad phoned again last night. They've been snowbound too. We enjoyed dad's letter and hope he'll forgive the birthday card being late. The night of the exam got me so excited I didn't post it until after class and it wasn't picked up till morning. Hope he had a nice birthday. Love, John and Ruth. 1560 Luxor Road, Cleveland, 18, Ohio. December 10th, 1950. Dearest Mother, So much has happened here in the past 10 days. I just finished a letter to you and was in the midst of listening listing the photographs when the doorbell chimed. Alex and Vera. They'd wired us that they were on their way and snowbound from New York. It took them from Saturday until Wednesday to get here from Philadelphia. Since they had no apartment, we invited them to stay till they found one, so they were here from Wednesday until the following Tuesday. It was just like the co-op and so much fun, all cooking and working together. We'd had the whole week off from school, 12 days in all, due to the storm, so that made it nice too, for me to have a, have company. They found a large apartment, $85. He has his Ph.D. while at the co-op, so has a terrific job. They've been over several times since they moved. Her baby comes in May, but she looks very pregnant. Mary's coming comes in March, and she's got a tiny girl and hardly looks plump. Well, with guests for a week, we got used to it, so since Saturday night was John's fraternity formal, Anne and Wayne Duff came here for supper, and afterwards Alex and Vera came for a while, too. Then Anne and I got our formals on, and we all went to the dance. We had such a good time, and Anne and Wayne stayed overnight on the sectional, and on an air mattress of Alex. They went back to Akron today, and tonight Joan, Lenny, and Vince and Mary came over and stayed for coffee. So we've had a passing parade of visitors. I think it's so good because they're all such nice young couples, although Vince reminds me of Daddy sometimes because he gets so ornery and wants to monopolize all the conversation. It's interesting because he's only been like this since she's been expecting the baby, and John thinks it's partly jealousy and partly a sense of inferiority. Anyway, we feel very lucky to have such a swell group of friends. Anne and Wayne have invited all ten of us for next Saturday and also the Wednesday after Christmas, and we hope to have them all back maybe New Year's or so. With this world situation, it might not be too long until some of the fellows will be drafted. One of the fellows we were out with on Labor Day is now in Korea, and he'd been in three years of the last war. It's such a shame. It's funny. After you always saying I was a career girl type and not domestic, how much I like being home and cooking. I guess I've just taught enough years for now. I realize how unusually lucky I am, though, for John is an, is an unusually helpful and understanding person, really sweet, but firm when I try to get away with too much. I never knew that being married could be so nice. Well, we've just about got all our bills paid, furniture paid for, and we'll start to set my checks aside. <clears throat> I wore my green formal and my necklace and earrings, and everyone thought it was very nice. I love you all so much and hope you don't you don't be too cross for not sending the photographs sooner. We're still married, and that's the important part. Love, John and Ruth. To be continued. Well, that concludes today's presentation. Good luck to you with your efforts in family history. If this interests you, finding, preserving, and sharing old letters, diaries, and photographs, and interviewing elderly relatives while they're alive, 
you might consider checking out our website, Adventures in History with Peter J. Ray at peterjray.com. So far, we've made 564 history videos in seven areas. World history, American history, book reviews, poetic tours, Cleveland baseball, family history, and autobiography. You also might consider checking out our podcast, Adventures in History, which you can listen to on Spotify, Breaker, Google Podcasts, and Radio Public. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. God bless you. Take care, and I'll see you next time.